But you want to read the good, the bad, the ugly, and the recap, allphly.com from Kyle Newbeck. Kyle, how much did you have to almost change in the fourth quarter because the game flipped on his head? Well, one, I think there's only one loafer guy on the show, just just to be clear. It's the guy who chose it as his avatar for whatever reason. <laughs> um, I So that's kind of the beauty of how I write these, right? I don't do like a A to B to C to D type traditional recap so I can plug and play and just stream of consciousness, the whole thing. But I will tell you, it was certainly chaotic. And the, it was really that opening seven minutes or so of the fourth quarter. They did stabilize after that. That's why they're able to get a win. But it's just that that sequence there encapsulates why even without several other best players, the Heat just scared the bejesus out of so many like good teams because they're on life support the whole game. They can't score. They can't do this. And then Eric Spoel shows like, oh, we're just going to throw some full court defense and pressure <laughs> at you. And you're going to turn it over multiple times in a row and maybe get away with an eight second violation and then turn it <laughs> over again. And they just have such a reliable ability to junk up a game no matter who's on the floor. So I, to a certain extent, you just give Miami credit for that. Like I, I think under Spo, they have earned that. Certainly the Sixers <laughs> made quite a few mistakes, but they were able to come away with the win, and that's probably what matters in the end. What, what do you think has gotten into Kelly over the last couple of games? And I don't even just mean the points, but I mean defensively. So we talked with him a little bit at his locker tonight and certainly asked about him with the other guys we spoke with. I think some of it is that they've had a fairly consistent group available for a while now. Like, we talk about, well, they have so many guys injured, but – they've had mostly the same guys injured, right? And so the rotation for the first time in a while has at least had some stability. And so he understands, okay, this is my role with this group. And he has synergy with different guys. Like I think even with the bench guys, I think him and campaign now have hooked up quite a few times where they seem to have a good understanding between one another. The defense, it, it, I think it has been a team-wide thing, right? Like I think the rotations have been much better I think Kyle Lowry has made a difference there. He constantly makes the low man rotation. And so then the next one comes and it's like once you set the standard at the beginning of a game, there's a trickle down effect. Uh, Ubre also said something he gave uh, the coaching staff credit for, specifically mentioned uh, Kobe Carl, who previously was head of the Blue Coats, now on Nick Nurse's bench staff, that he's been big on him in terms of the passing reads. Like I, I think Kelly has gotten to a place where the where Nick Nurse and the rest of the staff are getting happier about how he's attacking and seeing other people. I thought there were a few notable examples tonight of him using the, the pressure that he creates and the guys collapsing on his drives to then find somebody on the perimeter and turning that into, even if he doesn't get the direct assist, he's the one who makes the most important part of that play, which is drawing the attention. And so, like, look, the scoring is great. They're getting that from him constantly. But when he defends like this, when he sees the floor and wants to see the floor and is receptive to the coaches saying, hey, look, we see this on film, and they hammer that, and he responds to it, that to me is more important than anything because the book on him for so much of his career has been Kelly Oubre plays how Kelly Oubre plays, and you just have to take what you can get. Well, if you get – the, the Kelly Oubre strengths, and then he adds on stuff because he's a, a he's listening. That that's great, and that makes him such a more dangerous player into the playoffs. After getting off to a good start in the first quarter, Tyrese Maxey has 17 points there, just one in the second in eight plus minutes, and just couldn't really get things going. Give credit also to Miami's defense and how they change things. We talk often about how good he is and how he adjusts showing us different things from game to game. Uh, how much more can we say after, again, good start, bad second quarter, but comes back there in that third, figures them out once again? Yeah, look, like to me, one of the important storylines from that game is Tyrese killed from mid-range. Like that, that's a, a shot that I think has been a bit of a pain point for him this year at times where – We've seen openings for him, and he gets there, and then he's taken 
fadeaways or it's the difficult angle. And I asked him about it after the game, and he said it's something his dad had been harping on him for for a long time, that he's like, Dad, they just want me to shoot threes and layups, and that's what I got to focus on. And now that he's the lead guard, he sees more of that. So that's part of it. A big, another big piece of it is playing next to Kyle Lowry and being able to kind of divvy up responsibilities as the game rolls on, right, where Tyrese can be an off-ball guy and be a catch-and-shoot player or attack closeouts. And then the next possession, Tyrese is calling for a ball screen and he's being a passer, like scored 30 points but also had 10 assists tonight and also had eight rebounds tonight. And that's the, I'm not saying that's the standard, right? If he could average 38 and 10, he'd be the MVP of the league. But for him to be able to impact the game a different way, so like as he's dropping off as a scorer, he's becoming more of a playmaker. And I see Jay at a jungle is pointing out in the chat that the defense has been a nice development, right? Like it's been awesome to see him raise his level there. That's going to be really important in the playoffs where I do think that Maxi has been a target at times against good teams in the past. And by at times, I mean quite often, especially against teams like Boston. And he's proven he can raise his level enough to bother guys now. So that part's really important too. It's just awesome to see him impacting the game in so many different ways, even if the scoring tails off. Obviously, a couple key guys still out. Uh, what do you have about DeAnthony and Tobias and the upcoming trip? So DeAnthony, we got a, there is no update from Nick Nurse. So I not continue great. to be pessimistic on, on him and not because of what we're hearing or not hearing, just because he's been out for so long and it's a back issue. I, I just don't know how you can have any confidence in him. Like, let's say he comes back the same time as Joel. I, I just, how long can you trust him to stay healthy at this point? This is the, we haven't gotten a definitive positive update. Even when he came back to play, it was like a lot of, yeah, he's good enough, but then he land, has a funny landing and ends up back out of the lineup again. Uh, Tobias, it sounds like Nick Nurse was pretty optimistic. And as I've said on this time, or on this show many times, that, that means almost nothing to me anymore <laughs> because <laughs> there have been a lot of moments of optimism before guys miss like three or four more games. He is going to travel on this West Coast trip, so that suggests he is likely to play at some point, but whether that means he plays Wednesday or is potentially back for the L.A. component, we shall see. Don't know that quite yet. With uh, Let's assume that Melton does not come back, or at least if he does come back, it's not going to be consistent play because this thing can flare up at any point. But Embiid does, and he's back for the stretch run, maybe last week of the season and including into the playoffs. Seeing what you're seeing from Kyle Lowry, maybe the numbers drop a little bit, and even just the fact that he will have Embiid back on the floor, how much if we're looking at a 20, 15, 20, 25 minute a night player from Lowry can make up for the absence if that is the case for Melton. So the concern I have if they don't get 100% Melton back, which I, I think we would probably all agree it's unrealistic to expect them to be 100% at any point this season, is that I don't think they have a ton of defensive versatility. I do think Kyle Lowry has shown the value that he has as a team defender, somebody who will get to a spot on time mm -hmm and set up subsequent rotations. And in, with the way the NBA is today, that can often be more important than man defense. But if you're talking about having to try to beat a team like Boston specifically, and it's maybe it's putting the cart before the horse, they, more than likely they don't even get the opportunity to play Boston in the playoffs. But let, let's just say they do. So you're I'm really Boston worried. Boston being a first round exit? <laughs> not even make it to the Eastern Conference Finals to play the Sixers? That's what you're saying? Uh, I'm not even going to humor that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I, my concern right now against a team like Boston is that Nick Batum is their first option for a lot of perimeter assignments, and I think that's a, a recipe for disaster. Now, to the point that was made earlier, I do think Kelly being this good defensively and locking in the way he has gives you some hope, but – it's hard for me to see a rotation right now against Boston where the Celtics don't find 
wherever the pressure point is. And I'm not saying DeAnthony fixes that by himself, but he would certainly make a difference. And so I, that would be my biggest concern if he's never able to get back or if he comes back and we can all see that he's compromised and just doing his best to be out there for the team. All right, man, as they get ready for this four-game road trip, we were just talking briefly, and I know we'll talk more tomorrow uh, about this, but good to, for them to just simply take the two here at home as they are jumbled up here with Miami, Indiana, even Orlando, and trying to, as we said, just simply put together some wins, man. Yeah, look, this was a, it's a full-game swing because this is a team that you're directly competing with. I believe they have one more against them, and if they win that one, they can at least tie the season series. So you can't win it outright. So you're not going to get a tiebreaker, but that means that you could at least end up in lockstep with them for the season series. So that that's an, another important one on the horizon. Had to win this one to get that. So it wasn't pretty in the fourth quarter for a long part of it, but I would say in terms of end-to-end -end full game that was one of their better performances uh, without joel just in terms of defensive crispness i thought the ball moved well i thought even if they had bad stretches against the zone that they they there have they have had much more talent and failed a lot harder than they did against the zone tonight so i thought that was probably a good sign and a, a good reflection on those guys we all silly like the mayor 